do a second. A little while on here. Oh, y'all gotta forgive me. Let me take my eye patch off. Got one of them little things. If I get this here set up, you know, YouTube take a little while to send this here out. What, what's it like? Friday night. Everybody in the bed. Let me see here. Get this here situated. Want to pop on here. I think I turned off the chat. And the reason why I turned the chat off is just because a lot of people have not worked on themselves. And when you touching on certain things and people haven't worked on themselves, they come and they, they bleed all over everybody else. And I was noticing that with my, the video I posted earlier where I've been doing this long enough, you know, and been in the trenches and I've made the mistake of jumping to conclusions you know i've made the mistake of just looking at what something looks like on the surface and not going behind the scenes and not looking to see and and a lot of times what people we, we come to this thing where we're so quick to say victim blaming or victim shaming without even understanding that there is such a thing as provocation and there is such a thing as people not knowing how to handle being provoked. So a lot of times men or women will say, hey, there's never a reason for this. And that may be true, but that's not real life. So if we don't understand that by us going into a situation, if we're not very diligent and we're not very attentive, what is right or what is fair does not matter. But what I've been noticing is that a lot of common sense is going over our head and we're not really understanding and we're looking at situations from our trauma. And we looking at it from our experiences instead of understanding that in a relationship, there's always two sides to the story. And the third side would be an outsider's interpretation because each person will have their truth, but then the outsider will have their interpretation. And what we also have to look and realize is that some people take and handle things the wrong way. So if you go into a situation and you don't learn from a situation, y'all got to forgive my thing. We got on me and my son left the refrigerator open. I must have left the refrigerator open, so going to chime in. So if you go into a situation and you don't analyze it, this is what will mess around and it'll get somebody ended because here's the thing. This is what I try to help people understand is my dad taught my sister this at a young age because she hit me and I hit her back. But I'm two years older than her, and I'm stronger than her. So when I hit her back, she felt it. It hurt her. And my sister went to my dad, and she was like, hey, daddy, Tony hit me. He taught her a very valuable lesson as a young woman, knowing that one day she's going to be in a relationship with a man. He said, Tisha, don't hit somebody and then expect them not to hit you back harder. 
So he taught her a very, very valuable life lesson because what we're doing today is we're telling people, hey, you can say whatever you want to say, do whatever you want to do, and at no, at no time should someone ever respond in a way that you don't like. Instead, we should be saying, hey, you got to learn people and you got to see how somebody was raised. You got to see how somebody moved because you may come in and say, oh, well, I just said this or I only did that. But if you don't take into consideration how that person was raised and where that person's mental makeup is, you could end up costing yourself because you were under the idea that you could say or do whatever you want to say or do. And so in the Kiki Palmer situation, I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying that's the lesson that you have to take from these situations that happen in front of us. We can't just take it and go and say, well, oh, well, that should have never happened. So I'm going to keep I'm going to keep cussing somebody out or I'm going to keep poking the bear because a physical response should never be the response. We don't get to determine how somebody responds. So we have to make sure that we are a defensive driver. So it's like this right here. You have to think about this. If you in the road and what I was talking about, how sometimes abusers, they want control. And if they feel like they're losing control, then they will lose their mind. And you have to be able when you get to know somebody you got to pay attention to their cues because one thing that does not happen. And when I say does not happen, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, which is a figure of speech. One thing that does not happen is where you with somebody and they show zero signs. Like they've never yelled. They've never cursed. They've never been controlling. They've never been jealous. Like where they show zero signs. And then all of a sudden, one day, they just put hands on them. If you, if you look back at it, you will see where, okay, mm, that yell. Mm, cursed at me. Mm, slamming doors. Mm, trying to dictate how I dress, who I talk to, how long I talk to them. Mm, you know what? So you have to understand where you have maladaptive behavior. Before the maladaptive behavior, there is an antecedent behavior. So what we do a lot of times is we will take Cause I remember, I remember talking to a guy and, um, he told me, he's like, yeah, man, my lady, we got into an argument and she punched me in the nose. She punched me in the nose, broke my nose. And then she grabbed me and she body slammed me on the car. Well, his woman was like a fighter. She was like a fighter, you know, like a Ronda Rousey. So somebody who trained as a fighter, somebody who she played football. She played in the women's football league. So she was a linebacker. So she had to learn how to throw her body around. So here's this guy. He's trying to be the bigger man. And he's like, hey, a man does not put hands on a woman. And But his woman, she took advantage of that and she punched him in the nose. And then she grabbed him and slammed him on the hood of the car. So that's what I mean is when you're looking at life, you can't ever take and get comfortable to where you say, oh, a person will never respond like this or a person will never respond like that. You have to pay attention to the signs and you have to pick up the cues. And so 
just how everybody says, anytime I, I try to talk about the physical difference between verbal abuse and physical abuse, somebody who was verbally abused and they still are hurting from it or they still could feel the pain from it, they will say, hey, verbal abuse is just as bad as physical abuse. And it could be worse. And that is true to an extent. Because if you say something verbally to me, it may make me suicidal or homicidal, but the words did not take my life. I would have to do that. But now if you take and you hit me in my temple, now that physicality can end me right away. So one is like a slow drip and one is boom, it's sudden. And so, but both are dangerous. So you have to understand where you can't just look at it and say, oh, well, I'd rather be slapped than cursed out every day. Because one day, one of those licks could end you. And so there's a lot of relationships that normalize abuse. There's a lot of people who normalize this and they say, hey, this is what it is. This is a relationship. This is love. A lot of people normalize this because they seen it growing up or they heard about it. So they take and say, oh, this is this is a part of a relationship. And that's dangerous because it only gets worse the longer you go. The longer you stay, the worse it gets. Because when someone is acting out in an abusive way, what that is doing is it's giving them a release. So you ever seen somebody who, because they were in a toxic relationship and they, they were always arguing, they was always fussing, they was always fighting. When they get out of that relationship and they go into another relationship, if the relationship is calm, they feel uneasy. They feel like something is off. And so they will take and start an argument start a fight because the brain gives a release to the bloodstream from that raised voice, from that arguing. And it becomes a twisted form of bonding. That's why you see the articles about arguments being good for a relationship. Really what they're saying without saying it, what they're overlooking is the the release that the brain does from the arguing. So it's, it's sometimes people will be arguing and they will get turned on because of the release from the brain and because of the communication. So somebody could take, for example, a woman could be trying to get a man to communicate and the man is like, I'm good. I don't want to talk about it. I'm good. And then when she mess around and call him a name, you such and such, such and such. Now he get mad. He go off. Who, what you doing? Why you talking to me like that? See, this thing. And so now when she goes off, he then gets angry and he responds. Any behavior that is recognized and rewarded repeats itself. So now the woman says, oh, if I try to talk cool, calm and collected, he'll just shut down and he won't talk. So I got to call him out of his name to make him mad. Then he's going to open up and talk. So now they just formed a language of abuse. So we're in relationships that the relationship is a game of manipulation. And the thing about manipulation is it's very dangerous because when you are manipulating and when you're playing mind games, 
You never know when a person reaches their edge. You never know when the mind games push someone to the edge. So, yes, there is such a thing as, and I've seen a lady comment this. She said, she said that, she said her man would like say, be verbally abusive. He would be verbally, verbally, verbally abusive. And he would be like just mm, poking the bear, poking the bear, poking the bear. Then she said they would get in public and he knew how to like just whisper a little something, just say something. And then when she go off, she looked crazy. And this is the thing what people are overlooking is that in these relationships, it's not as common for someone to be a complete 100% bystander. It happens, but it's not as common as it is for one person to use one form of abuse and the other person respond with another form of abuse. So this is the thing. And it could go either way. But the more you study relationships and the more you look around and the more you analyze them, you will see that today, the reason why so many relationships are miserable is because the relationship isn't the art of love. The relationship is the art of manipulation. So you have women who will use sex to emotionally abuse their man. And then you have men who will use finances to emotionally abuse their woman. Then you have sometimes one person who will use verbal abuse and then the other person will use physical. So one person could be verbal and they slicing and dicing with their words. Then the other person gets angry and they get physical. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the human experience, you will see this even in your children. You will see in children where one child can say something to this other child and this other child, they just haul off and hit the person. Now, you don't necessarily call the child abusive. You may say this child short circuited. This child got a temper. This child, you yell at him or her, they finna swing. And that's how, how their brain is wired. So as adults, we have to realize like, hey, just because I don't want to get physical and I just want to, you know, sword fight with words, it doesn't mean that the person I'm dealing with knows how or have the cognitive ability to sword fight with their words too. Some people, when they are pushed to an edge, they come out swinging. So where so so people will say, "Hey, you know, there's never ever there's never a time where someone should put hands on somebody else." Yes, that sounds good. It sounds good, but it's not reality. You have to be rooted in reality because if you're telling yourself that there's never a time and there's nothing that you say or nothing that you do should ever warrant someone getting physical with you, you're going to get yourself hurt because you don't know how this person is wired. You don't know. And so we get so caught up as humans being, being short-sighted that we don't understand that there are explanations for behavior and an explanation is different than an excuse. So you have to understand the difference between an explanation and an excuse. And you have to also understand that we become a reflection of the person we're with. And when we are no longer a reflection or they're no longer a reflection of us, we remove ourselves from the relationship. So just how, and this is the thing. Now, I haven't went and read about it, but I think I just read a headline that said that the ex-girlfriend of Jonathan Majors, I think that's his name, was arrested 
for domestic violence after she, but she filed a case on him. So here's the thing for everybody in the Me Too movement, for everybody in, you know, these different little movements could have immediately just wrote him off. But I've gained the wisdom now to look and say, listen, we don't know who guilty in this. This is what it says, but it's going to take time to see what was done and what, what the real truth is. And so when I came and now what I was talking about, I was saying, hey, you know, make good shouldn't even be standing beside him with the allegations. Yeah, we're not saying yeah, you can stand beside him, but not publicly because you got a brand and you got a name. And then what if he is guilty? So let them know you you support him and all of that, but don't just go throwing your name out there. The Bible says be slow to be insurance for a man. So we have to understand this. But now when you look into it, so there is such a thing as somebody taking and saying, hey, I want to be able to get out of this in a certain way. I want to be able to, here's the thing where like, if somebody can figure out someone's triggers and they can say, hey, I want to take and paint this person like this as an abuser. So I know that this person can't handle when I say this or when I do this, they lose it. They, they could be diagnosed bipolar or something if, if they went and got the test done. And so because... I need to have this alibi. I'm going to say this and say that and do this and do that. And then when they go off, now they look crazy. See, when you study relationships enough, you realize that is a possibility. So you don't just jump to the conclusion and say, okay, this person is solely responsible and the other person had nothing to do with this. Instead, you say, okay, let me look a little deeper and let me understand that sometimes even in the letter of the police report, it don't tell the whole story. Just like when the police take the life of somebody unarmed, the way the police write it, it's going to make it look like this was a thug who just was disobeying the law and made the police scared for their life. But a dead man can't speak. But if you could see both sides of it, then you may see like, whoa, hold on. Now, this person ain't put your life in threat, police officer. You just overreacted and you took this person's life. That's what you have to understand when you're looking into abuse. When you're in a relationship, you have to make sure that you're paying attention to the signs of this person. You also have to make sure that you are not provoking the person nor are you reinforcing the person. So what happens is a lot of times in the infancy of a relationship, we reinforce toxic behavior. And so reinforcing the behavior is like watering a plant or like better term feeding a monster. So if you reinforce meaning by staying and forgiving and forgetting, if you reinforce being controlled, being told where you can and can't go, what you can and can't wear, who you can and can't talk to, if you reinforce that, you're feeding the monster. If you reinforce being yelled at, if you reinforce being cursed at, now what happens is you're feeding the monster. So what'll happen is, at first, the little control is disguised as cute. It's, dis it's disguised as care. It, it looks like, no, I don't want you to go out to the club, you know, with your friends. So it's like, oh, they want to spend time with me. You know what? That's so that's so respectable. That's so no, but they want to spend time with me. And so you, you reinforce it as, oh, that's cute. But what you don't realize is that's the seeds of real control because you still should have a life. You still should be able to go see your family, go see your friends. And so with grown boys and grown girls, 
like it happened both ways, and this is what people don't understand. It happened both ways. So you'll have, I see men who will be like, hey, you talking to your mom too much, or you talking to your brother too much, or you talking to your daddy too much. Like you need to be confiding in me. You need to be talking to me more. And they'll be like that. Then I see, I see women who they're like, hey, you, you seeing your child too much. You getting your child from your baby mama too much. You spending too much time with your child. You, you don't need to spend every weekend with your child. Some weekends you could spend it with me. And so now these on both sides, the male and the female, the man and the woman, are sowing seeds of control. When you don't check it and say, listen, that is controlling, that is jealous, that is insecure. And I'm not going to stand for that. When you ignore it in the infancy, now you feeding it and it becomes full grown. It's no longer an infant. Then it become a toddler. Then that thing you know it's a teenager. Then that thing you know it's a full grown insecurity or a full grown controlling behavior. And then it'll go from verbal to physical. And sometimes in there it may go verbal, then it may go social, then it may go financial, then it may go physical. So with the Kiki Palmer situation, we don't know what happened. We don't know. Yeah, we could see that he went after her and we, we could see that. And so we know he wrong for that. But we also don't know his mental makeup. We also don't know the antecedent behavior. We also don't know what was said to him, what was told to him. And as adults, people say, oh, you justifying the behavior. No, not justifying the behavior. Everybody and their mama know that it's wrong. But we also as humans know that there are situations where even us will overreact or we will do something that we know is wrong because of what was said to us or because of what was done to us or because of our mental makeup or because of our own trauma. It doesn't make what we did right. It doesn't excuse what we did, but it is an explanation of what was done. So like the case where the young lady, she ended up getting charged and I think she got prison time because she was texting her dude and she was like, you ought to, you ought to end it. Like you need to end it. Like you need to end it. And she was using her power. She was using her power. She was using her influence. And the verbal was breaking him down, breaking him down. Well, somebody could look. At first, somebody, when that happened, before the text messages got released, everybody was like, oh, another, another crazy young man, another lost young man, another, you know, just lost, lost lover, you know, another young man, but then when they released the text messages and they seen how she was poking the bear, poking the bear, poking the bear, how she kept stoking them, stoking them, stoking them, and then boom, he finally did what she said do. That don't make what he did right, but then you get, a, you get to see what the antecedent behavior was. You get to see the provocation. So guess what? In the court of law, Although he took his own life, she was charged criminally for coercing him to that. So this is why you have to understand that in these situations, you got to look at and you got to hear both sides. So then you can understand the stimuli and you can understand the outcome. You can understand the reaction. You, you have to understand the antecedent behavior or identify the antecedent behavior when you are analyzing the maladaptive behavior. And that's where you start to realize that, okay, this person, they overreacted to this right here situation that they was dealing with. So they mishandled their stress. 
They mishandled their trauma. They handled. So whereas this person should have been going to therapy and they should have been going and getting this help, they didn't go get that help. Instead, they did what they thought was the right thing to do or what they thought was necessary. And then the other person who became the victim in the physical sense, they did not pay attention to the cues. They did not adhere to the cues and say, uh oh, this right here, I don't went too far with this. This got too deep. Now, the exception to the rule is when the cues were not there, like the, the cues were so hidden. And that's why I say it's caveats and nuances. It's never one size fits all. But when you're analyzing something, you have to make sure you're not analyzing. When you're looking at somebody else's situation, you got to make sure you're not looking at it from your own trauma, from your own pain. You got to make sure that you're not looking at somebody else's situation and taking out your anger for what happened to you because what happened to us may be an exception to the rule or it may just be our experience and not theirs. But when you take and you look at it holistically, then you get to understand where a lot of times what's happening in couples, couples are bonding over their trauma. And the abuse is both ways, but it's different forms. But each form is reinforcing the other. And so there's this, there's this fine line. There's a fine line sometimes of where a, a man or a woman may have an idea that love is pain. So if a person is wrapped up in their head that love is pain, love is pain, love is pain, and if they're not experiencing pain, they then say, well, there must not be love. So then they start to exhibit these behaviors. They start to do what they saw as triggers from their parents or whoever they grew up around. They start to do those things because they say, okay, if I'm not getting this response, that means I'm not loved. That means that we're not really writers. We're not really no real couple. That like they have the guys who go out in the streets and they interview the young ladies. And I remember, remember seeing one of those street interviews and one of the young ladies, she said, yeah, I want to do like, I, 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 she was like, I'm kind of toxic. Like I want my dude to like, slap me up sometimes like i want my dude to you know do this right here like put hands on me and she was a, a caucasian uh young lady and with you know a lot of times people associate race or culture and think that one race better than the other and oh this race will never do that so when she said that i'm like man that's crazy but you know what that's a learned behavior but what she don't realize is she's associating physical abuse with love. But what she doesn't realize is she doesn't get to determine the extent of that. So where she's saying she want this guy to do this to her, she don't get to, she don't get to determine if when that happened, when if he going to stop. If he if he if he know how to turn that switch off and that's why you have to check your trauma at the door. You got to go get you some therapy and get you some coaching to make sure that you're not a willing participant in this situation. And the thing about it is there's no foolproof way other than dating slowly and looking for the signs and paying attention to the signs. Because if you go too far, if you get in too deep, it becomes harder and harder to leave. Because when children get involved, when sharing incomes get involved, when the whole community know you together, 
when you got a, a pretty picture in public, when you got businesses together, you never know when too far is too far. Like I just seen a young lady post, seen a young lady post in Houston who she says that she been saving face. She been saving face for her husband. And she say that now for years, she's been being abused. She's been, and that he's a narcissist. Now here's the thing. The danger with that is now for her, hopefully we, we, we like to hope that it, because they're in a the public eye and they own a big business together in Houston, we would like to hope that her celebrity, her notoriety will put like a hedge of protection around her. But the thing about it is, is a lot of times them flags was there. A lot of times the flag was there. Sometimes the flag was, sometimes the flag is, oh, you're an ex-con. Sometimes the flag, sometimes the flag is, oh, you very childish. Sometimes the flag is, why do you feel the need to have 50 cars? That's almost like a, a little boy syndrome collecting figurines like like who needs 50 cars who needs 80 cars see sometimes the flag is in another form of narcissism to where the red flag may not even be it, the flag may be why do you curse people out online and you cursing people out online every day in the comments like literally cursing and literally going off sometimes the red flag is not even against you it's how this person is talking to the waiter in the restaurant. It's how this person is talking to their mom. And notice I'm saying person because this is not gender specific. And that's where we that's where we make the mistake of just saying this is only women or this is only men or this is only a feminine trait or this only a masculine trait. See, sometimes the red flag is not that the person cursing you out. It's not that the person is controlling you. It's not that the person is putting hands on you. Well, that's not the red flag. That would be, you know, the result of ignoring the red flag. The red flag may be literally in a resume. So it's like this right here. If somebody went to prison for a violent crime or even for a nonviolent crime, okay, in my mind, you got a strike against you. You got a strike against you. It's like, if I'm a single man and I meet a woman and she tell me she went to prison for fraud, I have to realize there's a possibility that if we share a joint account, that she could start siphoning money off into another account if she tell me she went to prison for fraud. See, the red flag sometimes is in the resume. And so that's what happened is a lot of times women are going and getting an ex-con. Women are getting with a man who are ex-con and thinking like, oh, ex-con don't mean nothing. Yes, it means something. Yes, there are men who could be reformed. Yes, there are men who could change, but that don't mean that's going to be your grace. That don't mean that's going to be your lot in life. So it's no wrong. It's nothing wrong with having hard and fast rules having non-negotiables. There's nothing wrong with having non-negotiables. So if I was a single man and I met a woman and she say she used to strip, I'm not finna play with that spirit. I'm not playing with that spirit. That's a Jezebel spirit. I understand you in the church now, but I'm my hard and fast rule, I'm not playing with that spirit. You for somebody else. God bless you. I ain't knocking you now. I ain't knocking you. I ain't saying you can't change. It's just, I'm not going to take the chance. If, if I meet a woman and she say she went to prison for fraud, if I meet a woman, she say she went to prison for domestic violence. If I meet a woman and she say she used to do uh, porn, she used to, or she used to be an escort. Okay, God bless you. All right, God bless you. Hey, keep your head up now. Keep going now. She might be a better fit for Neo. 
or Jamie Foxx. Because they say the past and all that don't matter. So this the thing. A lot of times we end up in toxic situations because we ignore the resume. We ignore the relationship resume. We ignore the life resume. And we and we fail to realize that whatever spirit that we got to battle, whatever spirit that has been attached to us, we're going to have to fight that spirit for the rest of our life. The, de the devil, you resist the devil, he'll flee. But the devil ain't going to flee from nobody forever. You'll have a season of rest. But spiritual warfare coming back. And so you taking a chance when you get with somebody and you see that they got a temper. You see that they controlling. You see that they insecure. You see that they jealous. It's a chance that we take it. It's a chance when, when you get with somebody and you see that they, they a liar. That they cannot stop lying. That you, you done caught them in 50 lies. You're going to have to battle that spirit of lying for the rest of your life. That spirit of insecurity, the rest of our life. That spirit of jealousy, the rest of our life. We have to win that battle every day. Whatever we battle with, we got to win that battle every day. So you have to, and this is what I, when you meet somebody, when you identify their flaws, when you identify their flaws, you identify their red flags, you have to multiply it by three. Because when a person get comfortable, see, familiarity breeds contempt. When a person gets comfortable, everything get turned up. When a person get comfortable, everything multiplies. So if you meet somebody and they do a little burp while they talking, guess what? When you get married and get comfortable, it's going to be a full on belch. You meet somebody and they pass a little gas. When you get married and comfortable, it's going to be a full on <laughs> thunderclap. You have to understand if you meet somebody and they controlling, when you get together, when you get later, it's going to be you now by the prisoner. When they tell you, no, you can't wear that out. No, you can't wear that to the club. No, no you can't hang out with such such. When you get Married, you get together, all that finna be triple. Now they're gonna be putting time limits on your phone call with your mama. And the thing about it is, most of us have been through this stuff. Most of us have been through this stuff, but a lot of times we can't see past our trauma. A lot of times we can't see past our trauma, so we can't see the forest for the trees, or we cut our nose off despite our face. Now we can't smell what's cooking. Cause we done cut our nose despite our face. So you have to be able to go into this situation with open eyes. You got to be able to see past your trauma. You got to be able to see because sometimes what you want, it'll end up playing against you. So you could go in a situation and you could say, okay, well, you want this type of man because he worshiping you. That's not healthy. Now you want to be a God. Now you want to be idolized. So now you done pick this man because they worship you or you done pick this woman because they worship you. And then you got a sour patch face when they controlling you. You wanted somebody that was not on your level financially or not on your level looks wise. But now you turning your nose up when they telling you you can't wear this outside. When you pick this person for the very reason, because. They, they they put you on a pedestal. But now when they put you on the pedestal, they start worshiping you. So now they feel like they own you. Now they want to control you. But the very thing that you picked, you picked it from your insecurity. You picked it from your uncertainty. You picked it from your selfishness. You picked it from your greed. So you took and you fed the monster from your own devoid and now your own voice you done fed the monster and now the monster is bigger and stronger than you know how to control so now you're like oh whoa now nah, hold on now nah, hold on now nah, this ain't new not new I, I wanted a pet lion i wanted a pet bear but i thought if i raised the bear from a cub 
that the bear going to love me. You seen, you seen that story? He go to man, he get a cub, he raised the bear. One day, the bear knocked that food out of his hand and the bear ate him. This is what we doing in relationships. We going and we getting a, we getting a little trauma monster. We getting somebody who full of trauma and we think that the trauma cute. We think because they obsessing over us, we think that they don't want to, because they don't want to let us go out to the club. We think because they don't want us to hang with, with our knucklehead friend. Oh, that's cute. Oh, that's cute. Then next thing you know, now they don't want you going nowhere. Now they don't want you talking to nobody. They like, oh, hold on now. Hold on now. This ain't cute no more now. It was cute at first having somebody sniff my dirty drawers. Have somebody drink my dirty bath water out of straw. They were cute at first. But nah, hold on now. Nah. Hold on now. Nah. See, this is the thing as adults, what we got to realize it's always two sides to a story. It's always two sides to a story. So here's the thing: is a lot of times we want to be the victim. We want to be the victim. But what you have to understand about abusers abusers see a void see abusers stay far abusers will run from somebody who is very strong and very strict and who gonna stand on business like a abuser will run the other way because they realize they can't sneak and slip stuff by so what what an abuser is is like a like, like a heat-seeking missile to where if somebody want to abuse you, what they're going to do is they're going to play on your insecurity. They're going to play on your, your voids. They're going to play on what you lack. They're going to play on your lack of knowledge. They're going to play on your innocence. They're going to play on your naivete, your gullibleness. They're going to play on that. And they're going to come in and they're going to pretend that, oh, it's all good and gravy. Like, no, I'm, I'm no, they're going to come in. Oh, no, I'm putting you on a pedestal. No, I really love you. No, I'm crazy about you. So now because you insecure, that love bomb feel good. It feel good in the beginning because of your insecurity. And when they love bombing you, they filling you up, filling you up, filling you up. But you're not even paying attention that this is not healthy, that this amount of communication, this amount of time together, this amount of opinion and say so is not healthy. But what's happening is you don't realize that it's not healthy because you're so empty. You have such a void that for a while is filling you up. They filling up your love bucket. They filling up your account. And then it gets so full to where now it's running over and you like, whoa, slow down. Like, calm down now. Like, calm down. Like, nah, you know what I'm saying? I don't need to, I don't need all, all, all your opinions now. Like, I don't, I don't need to be with you, you know, eight hours a day now. Like, we, we got our own lives. We got our own jobs. We got our own family, our own friends. Like, we need some time apart like we need to be you need to go out to the dinner with your friends let me go out to dinner with my friends but because of the void that you came in with you don't realize that by you not taking care of you by you not healing you by you not getting new knowledge by you not taking your time you went in and you became the perfect fit for somebody who is also broken and full of voids themselves. And then we will ignore our own healing. We will ignore the rules and we'll, we'll know that we should take 12 months to get to know somebody, but we'll jump right in full fledged head first three months in because of our own voids, because of our own desperation, because of our own frustration from being single, because of our own situation, we'll ignore 
the rules. We'll ignore common sense. We'll ignore wisdom from our friends and family, and we will jump right in. And then we jump right in and we reinforce this person's insecurity. And we reinforce their brokenness with our presence. We reinforce it. And so now when they become controlling, we start to feel like, hmm, well, I can't lead this person because I done built with them. Can't lead this person because I got a child with them. Can't lead this person because all my friends and family know the good about this person. Can't lead this person because it is. So then we start trying to breathe and you start trying to get you a little freedom you start trying to, to break out a little bit. You start trying to get out of the house and you start trying to have your independence. But the person who was feeding your voids, filling up your voids and feeding your insecurity. Now they love where they was loving from a place of depletion. They love to fill you up. And now they feeling empty. Now they more empty than they came. So you got to picture this like this is two, two cups that's half full. So a two cups that's half full, well, the love bomber come and pour their whole cup into the other person. Now the other person feel full and good. So now you feeling full and you feeling good. You feeling healed because now your cup full. But what you did not realize is because you came in half empty, you attracted someone half empty. And when two people is half empty, one is going to deplete the other. Two half empty people don't complete each other. You deplete each other. Because now this half empty person fill you all the way up. Now you got your swag back. Now you want to get out. You want to go. You want to sniff and smell the rural. You want to be out to eat with your friends. You want to have guys nights. So you want to have girls nights. But now your, your, now your broken partner that you attracted when you was broken, now they completely depleted and they empty. So now they say, no, you can't go nowhere. No, you can't wear that to the Usher concert. No, you can't wear that to the Usher concert. No, you can't, you can't do that. But see, you ain't realize that from your brokenness and from your insecurity and by you not healing and getting clarity, to where you grew out of this person league, you attracted what you are. And so because you attracted what you are, now you become something new because you done grew and you done changed and you see things differently, but they didn't do the same thing. So now they, lo they perceived love, what you thought was love was really their insecurity. See, the thing about self-hate is, is sometimes self-hate could express itself as love. Like emptiness and brokenness can express itself as love. A person can love you from their insecurity, from their brokenness, but it's not really love. It's not a blessing. It's a snare. They putting a hook in you to make you think that is coming from a place of love, but it's really an entrapment. So now when you want to be a mermaid, you want to be a, a, a butterfly, you want to be free. They're like, whoa, no, 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 this death roll. No, we in the thing together. No, we, we, we trauma bonded. No, now you want to let your cheeks hang out? No. Now, now you wanna now you wanna go all out, now you wanna do all this, now you wanna be ripping and running. Now instead of them going and getting a life and living like you living and like having them something to do, no, they wanna be bonded to you because y'all met each other in y'all desperation, in y'all brokenness, in y'all loneliness, in y'all frustration. But one depletes the other. Meaning the one person will give of themselves, give of themselves, give of themselves, but it's to set you up, it's to trap you. And then when you want to when you want to be set free, you want to live, now they want to control you. 
And then when a person is trying to control you and you're trying to break free, they tighten the grip. The grip is tightened because they don't want to let you go because they fear that because they have dumped so much into you and because they've given you so many compliments and so much affirmation and they see that you loving yourself again, but you're loving yourself from their emptiness. They empty themselves to fill you up. And so now their fear is that you're going to go into the world as a butterfly and they're still a caterpillar. And a butterfly has nothing in common with a caterpillar. So it thinks. So their fear is that you will go out and meet another butterfly. So now what they want to do is rip your wings off. They want to rip your wings off so that you are flightless like them. And they flightless because they powerless and they empty because they done dumped everything of them into you. When both of y'all was half full. And this is where this abuse starts to really show up. But because it took time, you feel indebted to this person. Because in order to get to this point, y'all have shared a lot of laughs. You've shared a lot of good times. You've had a lot of good moments. And in the midst of the bad, you still going to have some good. This is the human experience. This is the human dichotomy. This is the human dynamic. This is what's perplexing about humans. And that's why it's always two sides to a story. And what we don't get to dictate and we don't get to determine, we don't get to dictate how somebody responds to their trauma. But what we have to do is make sure that we have our eyes open and that we are looking for the trauma cues. And that we paying attention to the signs. And in order to be able to see the signs in them, we got to be able to see the signs in ourselves. And if we don't see the sign in ourselves, we will struggle to see the sign in somebody else until it's too late. But what this person was, it's not that the person was a monster. It's that they were a broken individual who was fed. Their insecurity and their brokenness was fed with our presence. So our presence reinforced their brokenness and our presence sanctioned the environment. So they did not heal. The monster just was fed. And that monster is that trauma. It's not that they just a horrible person out the blue. It's not that they just this terrible, terrible person, but it's like whatever you focus on going to grow, whatever you feed going to grow. And that's what you have to realize. So that's why it's caveats and nuances to this thing. It, you got to really be you got to look at it holistically, comprehensively, and you got to be able to step back. You got to be able to step back because see, like, uh, see, see, you see what I'm saying? You don't know what this is. But see, when you step back, when you step back, now you can see the whole picture. That's where we go wrong. We get so caught up in the minutia, we can't see the forest for the trees. So then on the outside looking in, oh, this person was abused. This person was abused. Oh, this person just was abused. But we don't understand that they was the same. And, and they was reinforcing each other. It just one handle their trauma different than the other. And so it hurts differently. If somebody use their trauma with words and somebody use their trauma with fists. If somebody use their trauma with lying and somebody use their trauma with stealing. A lot of times it don't feel the same. The root is the same. Brokenness, insecurity, ignorance, a lack of healing, full of voids. But the fruit. It's different. See the root? See what I'm saying? Hey, this Tony Gaston. God bless you. And listen to you. L listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. And I'm, and I'm not saying this. 
I'm not saying, don't take this no kind of way. Don't take this no kind of way. But I'm going to tell you something like this. I, I'm in a season right now. I, I'm in the vein right now. I'm in the vein right now to what average minds, carnal minds, you got to watch what I say. You got to watch my stuff three, four, five times. And you got to, you got to shut up and you got to sit down and you got to listen. This ain't, this ain't no regular, this ain't, this ain't similar like over here. This ain't similar like this grass fed, this grass fed Texas cow over here. You can't come over here with that, with that little, with that shallow mindset, that old one-sided mindset. You got to, you, this ain't similar like. This ain't breast milk. And even if you're a vegan, this grass-fed cattle, you got to chew on this. You're going to have to chew on this. So anything I say, for those of y'all who you operating in your trauma, don't come on my page in my comments. Because I ain't going to say nothing that's wrong. I ain't going to say nothing that don't make no sense. So if it don't make sense to you, you got to listen to it two or three times. Because I'm speaking from the Holy Spirit. So when I'm explaining something, when I'm breaking it down, this ain't going to be surface level. You're going to have to sit down and you're going to have to listen. And then you're going to have to listen. You're going to have to listen spiritually. Then you're going to have to listen mentally. Then you're going to have to listen holistically. You can't listen carnally. You can't listen from your pain. You can't listen from your trauma. You can't listen from just your experience. You got to listen holistically you got to understand that it's several experiences that go into this and that explain this and it's never excusing behavior it's explaining behavior in order to eradicate you got to be open-minded because if you're not open-minded meaning if you're not willing to look at it from the other person's perspective you won't understand it you can't just look at it from the perceived victim's perspective. You have to look at it from the perceived offender's perspective, too. So when you see both of their perspectives, you can see who was feeding on what. You can see what cues was being heard, what cues was being felt. And this is what you're going to understand. So now then you're able to assess the situation and say, OK, this is a human. This is a human. But this is what this human felt and heard. This is what this human felt and heard. But see, we have this thing in society where we just we immediately victimize and villainize. Now, understanding both are humans. So you have to look at the antecedent behavior. You got to look at. The fuel, you got to get to the root. You can't just analyze the fruit. You got to get to the root. The fruit going to let you know what the tree is, but you still got to analyze the root. And so we just victimize or villainize. But when you seek to understand, when you understand the joker, it's going to better help you understand Batman. When you understand Batman, it's going to better help you understand the Joker. But in order to fully assess the situation, you can't just stand on the outside and just pick a side that resonate with your trauma or that resonate with your story. You got to look at both sides. So now, whichever side you own, you know how to heal. You know how to grow. You know how to change. You also know how to recognize because you took the time to completely analyze instead of just coming to criticize. Hey, listen to me again. This ain't similar like over here. You got to go to the single relationship coaches who ain't never been married, but they trying to tell you how to make a relationship work. You have to go over there for similar like got to go over there for, for breast milk. It could be healthy for you. Yeah, you're going to learn general basic stuff, but it's going to be different when you're hearing it from a different perspective. And I ain't saying that to brag or boast because with the knowledge of the Lord comes a strong confidence. I know who sent me. I know who called me. And I know 
I don't speak from my spirit. I let the Holy Spirit speak through me. So I'm trying to help y'all understand so that you realize even when you think you the victim, you need to identify if you played a part in your own story. And meaning when you are an adult, when you are an adult, it's different when you're a child and something happened to you. But when we, we talk about adulthood, where we have to go from the victim mentality and go to a victor mentality. And so when we've been victimized, in order to receive victory, we have to look and analyze as an adult what state of mind and what we see and what we reinforce and what things that we overlooked and what things that was there that we missed. And when you analyze that, now that's the game film. Now you're studying it. Now you could heal. Now when you go into the next situation, because you thoroughly analyzed it and because you took the time to heal, when you go to the next situation, you're going to recognize the red flags. You're going to recognize your triggers. You're going to recognize their triggers. You're going to recognize your red flags. You're going to recognize their red flags. And now you're going to have an ounce of prevention instead of just having to depend on the pound of cure. Hey, this is Tony Gas, and the thing about it is this ain't for everybody. If you're still in your pain, if you're still in your trauma, it's gonna be too hard for you because we only want to hear, we only want to hear the violin. We only want to hear the violin. We don't want to hear the drums that say, hey, it's time to march to a new beat. We don't want to hear the drum. We just want the violin because it's good for so ears. But them drums, it got the I got to get up. I got to stand up. I got to make a move. I got to march to this new beat. When we in our trauma, we just want that song. Everything. We just want that. And that's where, guess what? When we stay in that, that's how we become susceptible again. We become susceptible to going through the same thing again. So think about the people that you know. That go from abusive relationship to abusive relationship to abusive relationship to abusive relationship is because they never took the time to pause, to analyze, to heal, and to shift from victim to victor. That's what you got to do. Hey, God bless you. I went over my time about 38 minutes. I was going to do 30 minutes, then I was going to do 60 minutes. Still kept going. God bless you. We'll talk soon. I turn the comments off because a lot of time when the Holy Spirit is speaking, we got to shut the devil up. And it's a lot of people who they just so wrapped up in their own pain and their own trauma that they, they, they get in their own way and they can't hear nothing. So sometimes you have to shut it up so that the people who come to listen and come to learn, come to grow, come to heal, can get the message without being distracted by the devil trying to block people's progress and growth because of their own trauma and pain and what they're dealing with and not wanting to come out of that space. This Tony Gaskins, it's the realest online. You could bet that.